All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this week's Conversations of Agave. Um, I'm very excited that today we have with us Luis Loya of Nacion de las Verdes Matas um, and Pascal Amor Mata, and Hugo Gonzalez, uh, who works with the importer for the brand, uh, in addition to uh, doing uh, Maestros de Mascal and uh, Mascales Quiche. Um, so Hugo with a vine and spine and Luis, um, thank you so much for joining us from, from Monterrey, uh, Mexico. Um, Luis has been traveling the back roads of Northern Mexico uh, for the last nine years um, in the search for the best destilados de agave, um, meeting with different producers, learning the process. Um, and he is here to kind of give us the background and history about the, the destilados, particularly from Nuevo Leon and Tamaulipas, and just why, why it's so different, these borderland states in Mexico um, and the product that they're producing there. Um, Hugo's gonna jump in um, at times to add like commentary and everything, but um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Luis, whose name currently says Hugo Gonzalez, but wave your hands, Luis, so we know which, which one you are. Um, <laughs> And you go with the glasses on. So yeah. All right. So Luis, tell us tell us about um, the Salado de Agave from this part of the world. Okay. Well, thank you very much to everybody to join us and to hear about uh, some things about the uh, mezcal from the north. Uh, the mezcal from the north not very well known as another mezcal as, as Oaxaca as well. So I, I am from the north, I'm from Chihuahua. I was born there, but I live in Monterrey. I have lived here like for 25 years and uh, I get married here and I have a son from, from Nuevo Leon. So I'm particularly, I'm now from Monterrey. So I, I began with this uh, project because I like a lot Mezcal, a lot culture, a lot the country. My my parent, he's a uh, agricultor, or not a translation, a campesino. Uh, he has a ranch in Chihuahua, and I have been in touch with with the with the country all the time. So I miss the country. So I began traveling, and uh, now in this process here in, in, in the north of Mexico, and it's very a uh, good and interesting things to, to talk about. So let's begin uh, with the destilados or mezcals that we work right now. Uh, we have in the United States, uh, three states. Uh, from Durango, we have two, two regions. There is uh, Nuevo Leon in red and Tamaulipas in green. We're going, right now we are going to talk about these two states and the qualities of uh, destilados, okay? So it's, it's good to say that these states are at the, at the north, at the border with the sta uh, United States, and there is a lot of, of influence from the United States to the states of the north. We're going to talk about this influence with the destilados too, but the reality of these states of the producer are pretty different than the reality of the other states as, as Oaxaca, the people, all the time puts at the people of the producer in the same thing, but the, 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 the producer are very different, different realities at the north, at the center, at the occident, at, at, at the south of, all, of Mexico. So it's very uh, good to tell about this difference between a producer from the north and a producer from the south, or Oaxaca, that is the reference that we have now. Well. Let's begin talking about Nuevo Leon. Nuevo Leon, uh, we have three regions, two in the mountain and one in the desert. We have uh, the capital at the center. Monterrey is the third, um, the third uh, big city in Mexico, four billion people. We have at the north two regions that is Bustamante and Aldama. 
this uh, this search uh, ecosystem, this search for um, for the destillates, we have at the center uh, Santiago and the south Aramberry. These two are in the mountains. Okay. Uh, so let's begin talking with history. Let's talk about a little bit of history in in Monterrey wow. capital. Uh, Monterrey is an industrial city that it was founded like uh, 500 years ago, but the real population began at uh, 19s. Okay, this picture is about 19s. We can see at the uh, in fondo, the back. In the back, yeah. At the back, we can see the city of Monterrey, an industrial city, and we can see here at the beginning a lot of agaves. This is the neighborhood of San Luisito. A lot of people from San Luis Potosí emigrate to Monterrey to get a job in the industry, in the construction. They, so they, they, brought, they bring the agaves and they bring the, this, um, this tradition of the destillate and the pulque too. They use a lot of Salmiana, Salmiana Agaves or Magueyes, Salmiana. So it's, it's very, we have to say that this um, tradition began with the people from San Luis Potosí. In this neighborhood that was called San Luisito in reference to San Luis Potosí. Uh, all, all, the most of these people are an um, indigenous, uh, indi indigenous. Uh, indigenous people, yeah. Not yeah, yes. indigenous people. So, well, this at the 1980s, 1919, say, 1918s, was founded a very, uh, another, sorry, another picture and a church. Uh, you, we can see at the back there, the San Luisito Loma Larga, as well known as Loma Larga, and this is the Barrio San Luisito. You we can see a lot of agaves here, it's the reference at the early 19s in, in Monterrey, in this neighborhood. Hey, so, hey Luis, if you don't mind, uh, can, I, can I add something a little bit with the history of uh, uh, okay. from Monterrey, if you don't mind, from Nuevo León? So, okay, uh, yes. you guys, you saw the last two pictures, you know, about the history of uh, uh, Nuevo León. So, the thing also is good to mention is like, um, in the history of uh, Nuevo León, you know, it's like, they always try, you know, they had two times, you know, like, in the history of Mexico, they tried to split from what used to be called Mexico. Like they tried two times. I don't remember like the dates exactly, but the first time was with, uh, with Tamaulipas and Coahuila together. They tried to, to split from the country. And after a second time was only uh, Monterrey uh, with the Nuevo León and, and Coahuila. So that's, that's like what, what Luis Loya is talking about. It's like, it is a lot behind, you know, like the culture of, of Mezcal in the region. Sigue. Okay, well, uh, something important that uh, we have to say that here in, in 1880, 1880, around 1980, was founded uh, Cerveceria Cuauhtémoc. So it was founded Cerveceria Cuauhtémoc and it began um, a procedure with uh, a campaign with this prestige and persecution with the producer of mezcal and pulque. So I put this uh, propaganda from this um, factory of beer. It's the most powerful right now of the, of the country. And you can see that this what's saying that is so very good, the beer, that you can give it to the ch child. You can see <laughs> here is in, in, in Spanish and say that you have to give to the the child to, to grow up strong. But something interesting here is the negation, uh, uh, como se dice negacion? Like the, to deny, the, the, deny, the, you deny, know. Deny the culture because you see these childs are uh, uh, white and uh, ojos de color, como lo puedes describir? Uh, blue eyes, you know, green eyes, you know, like it was denying, you know, like what was at that time in Mexico, you know, like with Mainly, you know, all, the, the all indigenous the opposite, population. All the opposite with, with the people from San Luis Potosí, see, that was the people to bring this the culture of the, of the agave. So, at the 19... Um, 
Yes. Quick, sorry to interrupt. I have a quick question. Um, are there still uh, the pulquerias or haciendas in, in Monterrey, Nuevo Leon now? Uh, places that are producing pulque or? No, no. What, what's no. just people, what, what's workers? People that bring with, with, the, with the animals, or with the agaves, there was a no, no, no big uh, haciendas, wasn't exist big uh, haciendas okay. in Nuevo Leon. Yes. You have to understand uh, as an industrial uh, city, Monterrey, and just uh, an industrial city needs uh, workers, uh, mano de obra barata, that, that mm -hmm. vinieron desde, desde San Luis Potosí. No, no existía. Labor from, from all the way from San Luis Potosí, but that didn't exist any kind of haciendas pulqueras. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and even today, are there, are there pulquerias um, that continue or not really? No, no. It's, it's the no. second part that I want to say is with the oh, with this uh, <laughs> is, is with this persecution with uh, Aliado together with the government. They put a law in 1918 to close all the pulquerias and close and close clausurar all the mezcalerias. They, they shut Monterrey. down all the pulquerias and all the mezcalerias with the per persecution yeah. through, through the government, yeah. Right. Pu puedes decir... that, that was the same time as prohibition. Yeah, it's exactly, yeah. yeah like it was kind of like a prohibition era, but through the government, you know, like, why? Because the main thing they want to sell beer, that was the, the, the main idea, you know? And with that, you know, when that happened, you know, they disappear, um, disappear the, 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 this, this, this culture, you know, this heritage, you know, mezcal start to, to, to fading down, you know, slowly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Era, was, was very strong, to, this, uh, como puedes decir, Hugo, que era muy fuerte el movimiento de, de producción de pulque y de, y de mezcal, que había fábricas para construir o para fabricar alambiques. Uh, like he's trying to say like it, it was before that happened you know with the beer industry it was a strong you know like the the production of uh pulque you know and mezcal in the region for sure but you know like as you can see you know in the photos you know like on all this propaganda so it's like at the end you know it's like again sorry for repeat this fading away you know like the production of mezcal yeah so, uh, as, as I was say, saying that this new law, this uh, close all the pulquerias and all the mezcalerias, so this began to erase in the memory of the people from Monterrey who don't know the mezcal and the pulque. So right now, the people from Monterrey, they only drink beer from this company. So right now, the new generation, they don't know anything about pulque and mezcal, they don't know. So in 100 years, this company and the government is erased from the, from the memory of the people, the culture, the production of mezcal and pulque. So the new generation, they don't know what taste pulque and mezcal. Okay, so it's very important to say that. So let's begin, let's pass to the other parts of Nuevo Leon. But at the north, there is Bustamante. Bustamante be began, was very rich at the uh, Prohibition in, in the United States because there, there are 200, 200 kilometers away from Texas. So they began to produce a lot of mezcal para contrabando, I don't know the translation. To smuggling, to smuggling the, the mezcal, mm -hmm. yeah. The mezcal from the north, uh, uh, this, they use this kind of mes, uh, agave, the agave, uh, agave um, asperima. And this is the agave. And you can see here how is the background, como es la fotografía, how is the... How is the landscape, you know, around, uh, you can see around... Uh, it's like the, the desert, you know, like it's a desert and it's pretty dry. It's a lot of rocky, you know, it's a lot of bushes behind and are in the surroundings of the agave. So this is the agave that you said for the prohibition uh, era. It's agave asperima. In that time, they called it Rancho de Vino, ranch, wine ranch. 
the translation. So <laughs> there was around of 25 ranchos of vino that used como contrabando. ¿Cómo se dice contrabando? Smuggling. So it's like it was 26 different ranches, you know, like they used to work with this kind of agave. And, you know, everything was to smuggling through the border with uh, Texas. 200 kilometers that you crossed it with a donkey. And that's all that wasn't, no estaba tan vigilado. La, la frontera wasn't too much, um, como se puede ser vigilada la frontera? It, it was not like people didn't check, you know, there, it was not enough rangers, you know, like to check what it was crossing at that time. So. It, was, it was a pretty fluid border. It was yeah. a fluid border for a long time. <laughs> uh, uh. This is a picture from the last ranch of wine. wine el último rancho de vino is a uh, factory called it La Guadalupana is in Bustamante. They uh, keep using the uh, agave salmana, but they, they add sugar, uh, piloncillo. I don't know how it's the translation of piloncillo, uh, but it's pil sugar. Uh, piloncillo, I guess. Uh, Susan knows what is about it, you know, like in, 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 in this region, you know, they it's use raw a lot sugar. Of sugar. Yeah, yeah, they add sugar, sugar to the... The brown, raw and sugar, basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, but it's, it's the last one. Um, uh, it's uh, using a trapiche. Where I want to explain what is a, a trapiche, that is a meal. Um, but I want you to, to know about this region that is still having mezcal, producing destilado de agave. Okay, let's pass to another region that is Santiago. Santiago is at the mountain, it's, at, it's very close to Monterrey City. And it's about, it's about 2,000 meters above the Liberal Sea. And as you see, there is the agave, the most agave that they use it is agave Americana. And it's very climate cool. There is a very uh, biodiversity. Puedes explicar yeah. Hugo? Yeah, I can explain a, a little bit, you know, like I have the, the chance, you know, like to be there in the beginning of this year. So as you can see in the last picture, so like this kind of climate, you know, it's a climate of mountain climate. So the elevation point, you know, it's go pretty, it go really fast, you know, from flat, you know, you go two th over 2,000 meters above the sea level. Uh, and this is the way, you know, like you take a small road, you know, and as you can see, it's like between canyons. So the ecosystem, the biodiversity is really unique from the region. So it's, at least for me, you know, like remind me a lot of uh, Northern California, but with mezcal. So I guess that sounds fantastic. So also you can find, you know, like different kind of animals, you know, like bears, uh, deers. Um, it is just a unique place, I believe. Uh, so different from the rest of the places I've been. So, and took me by surprise, you know, like to be in there, you know, it's like such an interesting place. Also, you have um, waterfalls and you have like um, uh, uh, underwater rivers. So. Mm. Uh, I, I, we were talking about this uh, landscape. There are pines or conifers. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's also oh. like uh, a lot of... Uh, pine trees and oak trees is, is what it is, you know, when it's like so high in the mountains. It's what you will find, you know, around. It's very cool, cool weather, cold weather. So let's see this picture. It's a village. It's a Laguna de Sanchez where, where the maestro mezcalero, the mezcalero lives and he produces the mezcal. We can see here a lot of agaves that they use it for. This is the, the kind of agave, agave americana. They use it for pulque. Here to get the destillate uh, mezcal, here are two masters. One is the pulquero or plaquichero, and the other, the, uh, the uh, mezcalero. So in the process of the mezcal from uh, Santiago, they use a lot of pulque to use for the fermentation. It's mixed with cooked agave, agave and put it to fermentate. 60% pulque and 40% cooked agave. So, do they is, use the, the fibers as well, the mosto, when fermenting, or is it just the juice? Me puedes traducir, Hugo? 
que si utilizan el mosto para, o nada más, o des, eh, no usan el, el mosto para la fermentación. Yes, they, they, they use it, yes. They, they yes. use it. Okay. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So, you can see this is uh, the pulque for one, one production is about a thousand liters of pulque and like uh, one ton or two tons of, of um, crude agave. So, so. This after, uh, after cooking the agave underground, this smash the agave with a maso. With, this with canopy, a See, in this canoa, canoa with, with uh, a maso. Yeah, mullet. That's like, you can see there is like a bed stone. That's what they use to, to smash the agave with the mullet. So it's, it's by hand. It's very rudimentary, the, the system. So they use the, the distillation copper uh, with the alambique, the, the, el, comun, el comun alambique oh. destilador. They use it. Yeah. So, but there is a difference in the name states uh, the olla. In Oaxaca, this is called the olla. Here, they use it as perón, the mont, montera, manzana, and the serpentine, culebra. culebra. Okay? This is uh, a change of the names of the... It's, it's a lot of, yeah. um, uh, uh, how I will say, like the, the names, you know, change, you know, because of the region. So like what you, we used to see, you know, in Oaxaca, here they just change the name as, as, as uh, Luis mentioned, you know, like, but the idea is the Make same, you know, like bulk. they work with a uh, copper steel and they do two distillations mm -hmm. in copper, yeah. So if, with the question, we're, you know, we're all used to using the term palenque or palenquero. So what do they call, what do they call a palenque in Nueva León? Is it a vinata or? Vinata, vinata or rancho de vino. Mm -hmm. Rancho de vino. Or rancho de vino. Rancho de vino or vinata, but they use it as vinata and rancho de vino. Well, this is the, this is Jorge Son, is the sons of the producer. He, he these are the only producer in all region that use uh, mezcal limpio. What it is means is that they don't add sugar. They produce the mezcal as they uh, learn it from, from the uh, father of law of, of Jorge. Jorge is very interesting. Puedes explicar esta parte del, de, de, de la herencia del mezcal, Hugo, por favor? Okay, yeah, I can explain. Um, uh, what he's trying to exp explain, Susan, is like, uh, you know, the, in the picture is the son of Jorge, but Jorge, originally, he was not the guy, you know, like, the guy to teach Jorge was the father-in-law. It's the real mezcalero. Um, he was the, the one to teach Jorge how to make mezcal. In that region, they call it limpio, you know, like clean agave. As we mentioned before, you know, like, the, the important thing to mention here, you know, like, and this come to me, you know, it's like, it is the only maestro mezcalero, you know, like to work with clean agave. So that's really important to, to be aware, you know, like is don't, to don't lose the traditions, you know, like, I mean, in this region of Nuevo Leon, uh, I, I can say like it's an extinction, you know, in a way, you know, the mezcal, that's why we need to be really feel really lucky, you know, like people, you know, drinking this destilado and, Right. The way and, we need to and to clarify, them. yep, and then to clarify the difference between the mezcal limpia um, versus the the other mezcal produced or estilados produced is that they use no sugar additives in this, and others use a sugar additive um, or they add sugar into the process. Yeah, they add the piloncillo, or in other regions, you know, they add fruits, you know, like. But why they do that? They do that, like, they call it, like, rendimiento para que rinda más, like, to get more, you know, like, more volume, you know, from the drink. And, of course, with, with that, you know, they can sell it, it cheaper, más barato. Something import, important to say here is, as, as uh, Hugo says, it's the only mezcalero that makes this mezcal. The other producers, you add sugar to get to to can sell cheap the destilado because they have a lot of competition with the other alcoholic uh, bebidas alco alcoholicas uh -huh. uh, as the beer, as we sell the beer 
or whiskeys or tequilas. So they have to put this sugar to ca can sell a uh, cheap uh, product ch cheap. Uh, 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 to, to sell it cheaper, you know, like, but also, you know, like uh, the, the name of the ma real maestro Mescalero, like now he's retired, Don Beto. Uh, I have the chance to talk with him when I was there in the beginning of the year, you know, like, and asking him and having a couple of drinks together, uh, I asked this question, you know, like, if he remembers, you know, when, when you know, like, in that, the region, you know, like, people start to working with, with agave, you know, and, and, and he told me, like, since uh, 1730s, since the 1730s is, like, it is not in a record, it's what he told me, you know, like, and I just want to share it with you guys, you know, like, since 1730, you know, it's like, I guess it's been a long time. So like doing, you know, uh, destilado de agave, in the, the vino de mezcal in that region, vino de maguey. Yeah. Yes, uh, something that uh, you were talking about, Don Beto. Uh, he remember when for the fermentation they use cueros de vaca, oh, no, okay. cueros de cabra, si lo puedes decir. Okay, please. like the, the interesting part here is like, at that time, you know, like when Don Beto, when he was young, he, he mentioned also like to Luis, like they used to ferment in cow hide, like in Oaxaca, but not with cows, you know, it's like goat hide, like a goat hide. It's, you know, it's the, the thing they used to use the skin from the goat, you know, like to, to ferment, um, to do the fermentation process. Long time ago, not anymore. At, at the end of this, I, I would like to say some names, some uh, uh, change of the names. We know the first leaders as Puntas in Oaxaca. Here, the producer uh, say Flor. The Puntas are Flor. And the Cuerpo Corazón, or, or the leaders in the middle of the distillation, are called Panal. And the last one are called Vinillo. But it's very interesting uh, at the corazón or the heart of the distillation, uh, as a panal. Um, we were talking, Hugo and, and I, how to explain panal, what means. So, so Hugo, help me with, with, with this uh, meaning of panal. As you can see, Susan, you know, and all the people are listening to us, you know, the terminology is pretty different. So, but here, you know, the panal like, means is the, the heart of, of, the, of the, uh, the agave. It's, uh, they call it panal because it, it makes a lot of bubbles. So it's like, looks like when you see the honeycomb, you know, like a honeycomb and you see, you open the honeycomb and you can see like a, a lot, these little squares inside the honeycomb. So it's the way they look exactly, you know, with bubbles, like, so that's why I call it, they refer to panal. Uh, that's, that's right. And it's the difference between, they use uh, puntas, corazón, y cola, so, uh, they, they use it uh, flor, uh, panal, oh, and vinilla. vinillo, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Before we we go to the Tamaulipas, there is um, something that people uh, some question or something about Nuevo León before we go to Tamaulipas. Well, the, the question I had, um, and we had kind of talked about this beforehand, um, was for for almost a hundred years this remained illegal, correct? Like yes. people could not produce. Um, yes. And so in addition to mescalerias being closed, like the production means were completely underground. Yes, it's, uh, exactly. So like we need to also like uh, remember like um, during the prohibition in the United States. So being, you know, Nuevo Leon and being Tamaulipas near the border. So it's where, you know, like it was more all this underground activity, you know, the smuggling, uh, destilado de agave, or they used to call it tequila. So actually, it was uh, a group of people, you know, that they used to call them los tequileros. Uh, their, their actually job was just to smuggle tequila to the United States with donkeys and with mules. And the crazy thing here is like uh, the rangers from Texas, they always try to catch them, but uh, they were really smart, you know, in the way they, they teach their animals to, to go back to the Mexican border after they drop all the tequila alone without the owner. So they learn, you know, at night. So it was harder for the rangers. Every time they catch like the animal, it was the animal alone, not the people. So it was kind of 
like a something I really want to say in here. <laughs> you can say it. This is very funny, right? Oh, it's something so modeling, that you know, like I mean, because we need to think, you know, like think about it, like in the in the during the prohibition era in the United States, uh, Americans, you know, like they want they want to keep drinking, so it's like they made any kind of things to bring alcohol to the country, you know, like if you went all the way to the north with Canada, they smuggling alcohol there. When you went to the other side, you know, where was the savannah, they have a lot of rum, you know, smuggling a lot of rum from the islands also. So it was a fact like being close to the border with Texas. Yeah, like they need smoke tequila. Or oh, destilado de gallo. Something that, that I'm missing is about the flavor. Okay, before um, we talk about the flavor of the, this mezcal, I want to say they have been working with uh, Jorge family and Don Beto like eight years ago. I began working with, with Don Beto and then he, he doesn't work anymore. So I, I passed with, with Jorge, with his son-in-law. Uh, so we've been working like eight years ago with, with, this, with this mezcal. And talking about the, the flavor is a very different flavor about all the mezcals that you've been drinking. This smoky uh, flavor that most of the mezcal has is, is completely erased because the pulque and it's very, very different. That so different that sometimes I get trouble with people that is very straight and they say me, tell me it's not a mezcal or it's a mezcal. That's right, it's a mezcal. But you need to be a very open mind to try to bring this mezcal. It's a very, very nice flavor and, and it's very easy to drink. It's very sweet. Um, I don't know if we have some notes about Max Garon. He helped us to, to detail the notes of the, Matt, of the mezcal. I don't know if we have it there. Um, I did, and then my page crashed. Um, but it's uh, Max did do tasting notes for the brand name Amor Mata. Um, currently, I think the only place you can get it in the United States is in Los Angeles at Madre Mascaleria. Um, okay. And we're looking... We're looking forward to things changing in the future to, to get this mezcal in, in other areas. Um, I mean, I thought it, it, it's a very different and distinct flavor. And, and I mean that in a good way. It's got, you know, an, a very strong punch. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the wordsmith that Max is when it comes to describing flavors. Um, but, you know, like each of the mezcal from different parts of of Mexico, it it carries its own terroir flavor, um, and there there is a question about this, um, which is usually what is production size, uh, you know, when they're making this mezcal, and are they using wild agave or are they cultivating the agave that they're using in production? Quieres contestar? No, di contesta tú, por favor. Uh, the thing is, like uh, uh, Luis mentioned before, like uh, the one they use for pulque usually is uh, monocultivation. That's the agave because it's different. You know, like the one they use for pulque is just to make the pulque, and the one they use for mezcal is just to make mezcal. So, like mainly the one if used for mezcal is wild. So you need to go to pick it up in the mountains, you know. But the one where they extract the pulque, you know, is 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 is, is, is cultivado, is domesticado. So it's possible to cultivate it if the demand yes, became yes. such down the line. To, si es uh, que si es posible cultivar este, yeah, este we saw the picture. You, you see this? Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me see if I can go back. No, I cannot go back here. Um, so, so they, they can use a mix between, yeah. between the two if they yeah. want. And then for, for generally, um, the production size when they make when they make a batch, um, what how many liters is it um, usually? Oh, the, the, the production are, are around of um, three production by year, and uh, regularly are 150 liters each production. So at the year they have. 45, uh, 450 liters in 450 liters around, 500 yeah. liters around. Wow. So the production is pretty That's, small. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Um, and do they have, are they having any problems with um, agave theft um, in Nueva Leon, um, where they're taking agave over to Jalisco um, or to other parts of Mexico? Um, have you heard anything about this? Well, like, well, this is, I, I know the question is for Luis, but uh, I would like to answer a little bit about that. So yes, talking with Luis, you know, like not long time ago, is that to hear the, that the, 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 my few cents, you know, in this big question, you know, like uh, Nuevo León is not part of the DO of Mezcal. So I don't know if, if like the way it is, is better to steal like this or exactly. to be part of the DO, it will bring better um, results. But uh, at least in my opinion, that's my personal opinion, I believe like the way it is right now, it, it, it is the best, you know, like it, it start to be like more demand, you know, for this mezcal, but, but I believe like it, it was inside the idea of, of mezcal. So I guess like maybe bigger companies will want to come, you know, and try to do something. But the thing is, it's not possible, you know, it's not a business model like to that. As you mentioned before, it's 450 liters per year. So, and that's why it's called, it's a mezcal tradicional, right? Like you cannot push a maestro mm -hmm. mezcalero to produce, to make more, you know, because probably he will say yes, but the flavor will change, you know, the quality of the mezcal will change. It will not right. be taste the same, you know? Right, but the question was more about with the agave itself, if uh, Nueva Leon is having similar issues that other states are having, where the demand for agave is so high that people are coming and either buying up a okay. to go to other states to be used in in either tequila production or in agave nectar production, or if people are stealing agave, um, like if if there's been anything like that happening um, in Nuevo León. No, sabes, eh, Luis, si van personas por por agave nada más para llevárselo a otros estados de hacer mezcal o no, o no it, pasa eso no it's it's very good to don't be part in uh, of the do you know in the radar of Jalisco or other places it's a good thing to don't be in this do and one of, of those is uh, people doesn't came to take away the agave from this state it's a good thing mm -hmm. in Tamaulipas in Tamaulipas happen because it's there is a do that has both TOs, tequila um, and mezcal. So it's, uh -huh. it's in the radar. I don't know if it's the translation or radar of, of, of the industry of agave. So it's, it's, it's good to don't be there. Got it. Okay. okay. It not happened yet. So, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the answer. But, but, but as Probably people, people don't think Nueva Leon is a place that has agave. It's, it's, so, it's, well, people, yes. is, even in Mexico, still people, you know, like, I've been talking with people and they don't, still don't believe like in Nuevo León, it's a produ they produce a, a, a destilado de agave. Yes. Like, still people still denying that, you know, they like, it's not such a thing, you know, like in Mexico. Yes. yes. And, and we are not prepared to be in a DO because as Hugo told, uh, is the mezcal tradicional is, is very, very small, so, so small that if someone came and pushed the producer or the producer, it will collapse and we will lose uh, this uh, patrimonio from, from the state. So it's a good part to don't be in the DO. That's why I'm repeating and repeating this, but I want to get clear with this part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if no. something else to Nuevo León or you want to pass to Tamaulipas? No, let's start talking about Tamaulipas. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Well, there is the state of Tamaulipas. You see, is here is Texas. Texas. It's very, very particular. This uh, geography is like an elephant. It's like like a trompa. I don't know because the this of the parts, elephant, yeah. This is part a long time ago from Nuevo Leon. Sometimes Nuevo Leon want to independence from Mexico. So they changed the, they changed the, the politics division and they add 
the border to Tamaulipas. This is something that people uh, need to know. Okay, so here to is- To kind of close Nuevo Leon in further into the country. So, yes. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, that's right. Um, <sighs> we, we have here Ciudad Victoria is the capital. At the north, we have this region is uh, San Carlos is together with San Nicolas in it's another, how you say, uh, um, another no country, uh, municipio. I don't know how how you say uh, municipio, another municipality. Count, yeah, county. Two together, yeah. and we have another one at the south is Tula. We're going to talk about this region. Uh, San Carlos, we want to call us a uh, region of San Carlos. Um, so the, begin uh, the beginning with the uh, activity here uh, was, we need to, to talk about how is the topography, how is the Isperi Desert is not plain or flat, and is there is a lot of storms, como se dice, buches with storms, uh, como, um, como se dice Hugo? Co cual? Espinas, este... uh, torn. It's really torny, you know, like the landscape is really dry, really torny. And as you can see in the picture, so it's like really bushy. So also it's like uh, talking with Luis, he said like every time you walk in the middle of the bushes, you know, it's full of ticks. So you will yes. get a lot of the ticks, ticks. all over your uh, clothes. Okay. When I go, I always have to have to clean and, and put away my, my, my clothes because it's, it's a little... So it's what I'm trying to say, it's very hard to rain here. And their only lives uh, um, before a colony was uh, tribus or was uh, nomads. Yeah, if that you was want, changing. If you, you, you want, want to explain that part? Yeah, like uh, it will be really fast. You know, like uh, Tamaulipas, uh, just the state of Tamaulipas is pretty interesting. Uh, why is because, you know, like before they used to be, used to live like several tribes before what's called Tamaulipas. And one of that tribes, you know, they used to call the Mescalero tribe. So like pretty difference between the Mescalero tribe from the Mescaleros Apaches, you know, from, from New Mexico and part of Texas, you know, like it was unique, their unique um, group of people. So they, 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 they used to live in that region of San Carlos, like it's like a mountain thing and they, you can find a lot of agaves, but, but, but before, you know, like the main activity in the state was uh, mining. And, you know, like after mining collapse for a briefly period of time, you know, like mezcal, it was like supporting the economy of the state, but just for a tiny little period of time, you know, like, but it used to be a lot of tribes living in what is called now Tamaulipas. Yeah. Okay. So as, as Hugo says, was a parallel, parallel um, production with the minery was uh, the, produ uh, the production of mezcal with these people that came from San Luis Potosí. We're going to talk uh, people from San Luis Potosí came to Poblar, to, 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 to live, live here, uh, to live here in this region and, and work with the mines. So they know how, they know how to make the mezcal. So they saw that, uh, ellos vieron, they saw that this, uh, agave Americana in the region. There was a lot of, of agave, agave uh, as, as sperima and agave univitata. And mezcal traditional from Tamaulipas has to make this is an ensemble of fresh agaves. They don't, say, they don't separate as in Oaxaca. They use these fresh agave because these two agaves doesn't have much sugar, so they use this one, that is the Univitata Scalet Amole, is the a popular name. This other two doesn't have a popular name. This you call it Maguey because they hybridizing, say is it's mixed together in agave americana and asperimat. So there is no an unique form of agave, of big agave. So they just call it Maguey. And mm. to get this agave is a li little bit smaller. This, uh, you can see here is a lot of these, these ones and you have to climb and there, you have to go this kind of topography to get this agave. So this agave univitata, asperima and agave americana. 
Um, and as you can see there, Susan, the Unibitata one, you know, I guess in English they call it the torn crested agave. It is smaller than the mm -hmm. other ones, but it's the one who has, you know, more sugars. So that's the way, the traditional way in Tamaulipas is, it is like an example from these three, three agaves. Mm -hmm. And it's the same process of cooking, mashing, fermenting, and distilling together, all of them. Yes, and yes, they put it together from together. the beginning at the end. Yes. So we can see here some picture, uh, picture with the, three, uh, the different magueys. Here is an amole, the Univitata maguey. At, at here at the at back is the agave americana sperma or hybrids. It's better to say hybrids because mix a lot of this, this magueys. So it's the ensemble, it's the traditional ensemble of mezcal of Tamaulipas. One of the particularities of this uh, production is they use the juice. Doesn't use the, aga the um, como se dice, el baga bagazo. They don't use bagazo. So they need to use the juice as uh, the states of Jalisco, San Luis Potosí, Zacatecas, and Tamaulipas. As I, I told you, the people from San Luis Potosí bring this, uh, the, how to make the mezcal. So they, at the beginning, they use Taona as the haciendas mm -hmm. in San Luis Potosí. But it, the Taona is very big and so heavy to move from one place to another place. So the topography of, of, the, of the country is very, you know, it's not flat. And the agave was done in one part. So they have to move to another part. So it was very hard to, uh, to move in the Taona. So they import this, um, this meal is very uh, rustic meal imported from Nuevo León. In Mo Nuevo León, this, uh, the, this meal is, is called trapiche vertical and used for sugar mm -hmm. cane. So they import from okay. Nuevo León and they begin to use this meal. This, uh, I, I don't know if you see the pointer here. Uh, this is mm -hmm. in, how se it? Yeah, like the, as, as, as you can see right now there, where is it pointing right now, um, Luis, is like, it's where you put, you know, like the, the agave, you know, to mash it. It's the trapiche, you know, like it is a meal, you know, like they use to, they use, they use in sugar cane plantations. So it, what the, the function of this, it is you put the agave in the middle, you know, and you move it around, you know, and it, it just take out the juice, just to this get the a, juice. Yeah. And as you can see in the second And the part, juice is, yeah, the juice is captured in the bucket below yeah, it, or exactly. in the, the that's right, that's okay. Right. This is moving for a donkey or, or horse. Uh, this, uh, this arm is, you put it and, and put it as the taona, and moving the horse all the day to, to begin moving this, uh, this meal to get the juice, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's the difference with another states. We, uh, they use the juice, only the juice, and add water. Yeah. Add juice water and water, or, that's it. Juice and water, okay. Um, there was a question, this goes back to um, the previous photo with the cut agave. And it looked like on the agave, and the, they trimmed the pandas back as, as they do on other agave. Um, the, the, the next one forward by La the, otra, la the oven where they had all the cut No, no. Um, la otra. Was, no, ah. otra. Después. Ve hacia el frente. Después, después. Esta. No, de no. donde están los, Más, eh, los no. el horno con las piñas. Ah, that one. Con las piñas en, en el horno. Sí. And it, the, the question being um, that it looks like the pencas haven't been cut as closely on the agave in the front as they have been on the back. Yeah, and because... Is there a, re a reason to keep the... A little bit of the pancas on the well, the pina. Well, like the thing is, like the way the ones in the back, it is like the hybridization. You know, the hybrid between an americana and asperrima, and the other one are mm -hmm. they call it it's a tiny agave, it's really small, the univitata one. So it's more like like the, the, you can see the difference between the cut. So that's they they don't cut that well. No, it's the so, 
Sí, el, el aspérrima, está preguntando okay. ella por qué el aspérrima no está cortado como el, los, los, las piñas. Ok, well, I think it's, it's a tradition to uh, get more flavor. There is a, have a lot of sugar, so the pencas, you know, they have a lot of sugar too, mm -hmm. so they use it most of the body of the, of the agave to can Okay. Uh, to, uh, to have a very better uh, rendimiento, another translation, to, to have more sugar, to get a, a better production of mezcal. Okay. See? I, I don't know if you, you get. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, ¿Quedó yep. respondida? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, let's continue. Well, this is the picture of how, how it looks like the piñas. Uh, we, uh, we were talking about the meal. It's very, very interesting that the meal was imported from Nuevo León because they, they don't use it, uh, the taona. It's very big mm -hmm. and heavy to move around where is the agave. So another part, interesting part of the Mezcal Tamaulipas is uh, again the prohibition in the United States uh, as, as well the Tamaulipas state is next to Texas So it was easy to get the technology from the United States than the center or other states of, of Mexico. So they have uh, a lot of uh, communication with the moon chiners. So the moon chiners introduced the system of distillation, the modern system of distillation in Tamaulipas, you know. Um, yeah. has a particularity uh, of this stiller that they use a barrel between, uh, you know, where is boiling the, the fermentation and where is the, how, how to say, uh, the condenser. The condenser. Uh, and mm -hmm. another What? element. This is uh, Adam's patent, but this only copy, right now, the, the producers are only copying the aesthetics of this, of this form of the, the stealing. Uh, the Adam's steel, this, element it has a function but this right now the the, the producer in Tamaulipas is only used it for aesthetics uh, yeah. how how is this you can explain uh, a little bit uh, the, yeah this like uh, I was going to explain that part a little bit so the thing here is like because it's pretty close to the border uh, as, as Luis mentioned you know like it's two theories you know like about how in Tamaulipas ended up you know this system of moonshine system in Tamaulipas some people say it's like they because they They are really close with the border of the United States. They, they learn that system, but the, I research a little bit, you know, and other people say like the, during the prohibition era in the United States, a lot of entrepreneurs at that time, they believe like uh, it was opportunity because they couldn't distill in the United States. They moved to the other side of the border, you know, to keep produce, to keep uh, still doing moonshine. So that's the way, you know, like they bring um, this, this, this kind of distillation to, to Tamaulipas, but Right now, like in the, here in the image says, you know, like that barrel in the middle is called a tomper keg. In the moonshine world, they call it the tomper keg. So what that does, you know, the tomper keg, you know, like I've been reading a little bit about it. Uh, think about it like maybe in Oaxaca, if I'm wrong, just let me know people later. So the tomper keg, the function, you know, it's like, uh, people say it like, would be like to give like a, Uh, one distillation and a half or two distillations, but some people say not. The tumper cake, the function of the tumper cake, the barrel in the middle is to give flavor because in moonshine, what they do in the United States, it's like the tumper cake, they add flavors, you know, like, like think of a pechuga in, in mezcal. So they add the flavors, you know, in that tumper cake in the middle, that barrel in the middle. So it is all about it. But in Tamaulipas, it's just aesthetic, you know. If I ask Luis, you know, like, If actually works for doing function. something, the tumper keg, and he said like no, he believes like no, you know, it's just aesthetic. Just like, and you, we can see some pictures how, how some binatas are there. It's, it's called binata. You you have uh, the barrel there. There is uh, the la olla, and, and there is here the serpentine or, or the culebra. La culebra. There is an otter. Other. It's, it's the other one. Was, how you know, funky they are. Yes, and so, so, so strange uh, things that we, we found there. But uh, right now, as Hugo told us, this doesn't have function. 
uh, all the production get less if they use if they have an, an as Oaxaca they will no tendrían tantas pérdidas como tienen con esto no sé si lo puedes tú traducir what are you trying to say qué quieres decir que el, hace pérdidas mermas tú logras mermas con, con esto si no lo tuviera pues este tendrías un mezcal de mayor rendimiento it's uh, he's just trying to say like uh, he believes like if they didn't put that pumper cake in the middle it will be a uh, better you know they will lose less uh, pr from the product you know so they will actually have more of the product you know like but this is the way they do in 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 in, in Tamaulipas like you know like Tamaulipas let's not forget about it you know it's um also if i'm not wrong it is the only state as Luis mentioned before used to be part of the for a bit was part of the do in tequila was like a complete failure you know uh, in the 70s something like that and after in 1994 you know they they they, they, they become part of the do of mezcal so it's like it's a state it has two do's i don't know i don't think so i have the do of tequila anymore but at that, that time you know like uh, they push hard you know like to be part of the in the tequila do so it was actually um, really little, a medium sized famous uh, distillery called La Gonzaleña, you know, like, uh, and they, they were the first people, you know, like to bring to the United States uh, the first premium tequila under the name of uh, Chinaco. So it's like so many things we can see, you know, from, from Tamaulipas, you know, like the, the big idea for Luis is like to show you, you know, like, uh, it is, if it's a tradition of mezcal in the state, yes, definitely. It is a, a, it is a place where you can find mezcales tradicionales. Well, I don't know if we want to talk about the flavor of, of the mezcal of Tamaulipas, there is the notes, or you, do you try it, uh, Susan? Uh, no, I haven't had the Tamaulipas one yet. Um, I, I am looking forward to seeing you live and in person again when I can can taste it <laughs> unless unless who has some in uh, I, I mean I think um, you know one of the that we're accustoming in the landscape of Tamaulipas is the agave montana um, and and how that um, can be used uh, in production or if it is used in production um it's uh is it it would be used as an ensemble or would it be used on its own no no the, the agave montana is not part of the traditional uh, mezcal uh, agave montana it belongs to another part of, of uh, tamaulipas is three thousand meters above of the level of, of the sea and pretty high up it's very exotic agave it's very nice so people began to came and, and making experiments, trying to make mezcal. This year, I, I hear that thousands of tons get to Oaxaca to make mezcal with agave from, from, from agave Montana from Tamaulipas. So 10,000 of, of tons is a lot of agave. I don't know how many pieces are, but it's this, this part, there is a lot of agave Montana, but it's very exotic and it's in a very small ecosystem that we are attending again against to this ecosystem. So taking away as the tequileros, uh, it's, it's the same formula as tequileros like years ago when they took away from Oaxaca uh, agave, it's the same the, the mezcaleros from Oaxaca are doing with these agaves that are taken away from, from Tamaulipas. I don't know if you can, you can say uh, something, uh, well, something like, else. That, uh, that's like a, a really um, situation, you know, like, um, like people, you know, coming to Tamaulipas, you know, and, and trying to find this exotic agave, like it is a, an agave, you know, like to grow the, like in a really in the highland, really high up. So what they start to doing, you know, is just getting, you know, chopping agave from Montana, you know, collected and take it to other states, you know, to produce agave Montana. So like what Luis is trying to say is like, uh, we need to be careful, you know, like because that kind of ecosystem is pretty fragile. 
So, and also it's like that agave they don't use in Tamaulipas. It's not tradition. It's not a tradition, you know, like to make uh, mezcal in Tamaulipas. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, like people, you know, they're trying. I'm not. I don't know. Maybe through the demand, you know, like trying to do new different things. So they are coming to Tamaulipas to to take this agave and to and to make mezcal with with this agave. Yes. I mean, I'm sure that there's so many, you know, because uh, Mexico is home to so many different types of agave, um, of people experimenting more with different types to see, can, can you make a mezcal? Can you make a destilado from this? Um, and, you know, if yes, great. If no, then there becomes the continued experiment part of it. Well, do you combine it with something else? Do you try, you know, so it's a... It's, a, it's an interesting and, and I think long process we'll see um, as, as people experiment more with different types of agaves. And I think, you know, it has to do with you know, demand. Um, everybody wants wild agaves, um, uh, et cetera. Um, it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated in, in Tamaulipas because it is one of the few states that does have the DO for both Mescal and for, for tequila. Um, and it's kind of like, why? Um, it, I'm fascinated by those states, the regions that carry the, the dual DO um, because it, I, I, my, my question I guess would be like, why, why do we differentiate tequila and mezcal then if you're going uh, to give overlapping DO well, to, to the same? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like here is like when it starts to getting, you know, like the questions, you know, and the answer a little bit more tricky, right? Like, because at the end, I believe like um, why they are, they try to be, because uh, when I can see, you know, and again, it's my personal opinion, you know, like their set mind, you know, it's a business mind, you know, like they're trying to make money. So like, no, they don't have the set mind, you know, like, uh, like as a traditional mezcal, you know, with this kind of mezcales, you cannot make to money at all, you know, it's just a matter more like to preserve, you know, like, and to have the relationship, you know, with the maestros mezcaleros, but, you know, like, but what happens in the specific with Tamaulipas, with the Dio of tequila, it was more, I believe, political side in a way, you know, like, and because two big companies, I will not say names, I don't like to say names, you know, but two big tequila companies tried to move their production to Tamaulipas at that time, you know, like, but at the end, it, it just, it failed, totally failed. So that, that two companies back to, to, to Jalisco again. So I don't know, it's like, that's the only thing I can say. Yes, there was a, a friends with a lot of money, uh, power in the politics. That's why the EO tequila was there. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the tequila is most popular long time ago. Well, not long, long time ago, but sometime it was very, como se puede decir, what was uh, very popular. Right now, we have, to, we have to remember like 20 years ago, when mezcal wasn't in the era or, or, or no estaba en el radar, wasn't in the radar. The, it was not in the, the radar. Right, Pero yeah. es el tequila. Entonces, estos amigos se pusieron de acuerdo, solicitaron la denominación de origen del tequila y la movieron a Tamaulipas. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Uh, I don't know, it's like, no long time ago, you know, I was in a, I heard a conversation between two really famous people in the industry, Pedro Jimenez and um, Pico, no, and, and I, and again, you know, and I just want to make a reflection about this, like this kind of mezcales, you know, like the specific we are bringing to the United States, you know, with, um, um, with Amor Mata, Nación de las Verdes Matas, it's like, it is more like a matter of, uh, to teach people, you know, like what is a mezcal tradicional, so, and you, you, don't, you cannot make too much money about that, you know, the, the productions are pretty small, so it's like, I guess the, uh, mindset is different you know like that's why you know like we are just trying to educate people a little bit here in the united states you know like what what it is uh mezcal tradicional that's it but um there are a, a couple of questions um about the agaves themselves um number one um 
start with are are people in Tamaulipas starting to cultivate espadín um, or other types of agaves that are not uh, native to the region? And on top of that, uh, the question of how, what is the process in selecting ripe agaves in Tamaulipas? Uh, the rumor had it that a lot of the product that arrived in Oaxaca was actually a little on the green side, not too mature. Uh, I understand that you, you asking if uh, in Tamaulipas is cultivating another kind of, of agaves as, as padding, right? Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, there is a brand, there is a big brand that have uh, like 10 or 15 years, uh, this brand that is, is as the tequila, the tequila, when they use uh, to get in the DO of tequila, they bought uh, Gabe Tequilana Weber and came to Tamaulipas and cultivate. So it's the same, it is doing the same with the agave spadin. Because the agave spadin, they have a lot of sugar. So it uh, has a very good, un rendimiento muy notable comparado contra los agaves de aquí. It's, it's very better with sugar against with the endemical agaves from Tamaulipas. That's why they are doing this, the same as the tequila and sometimes. Uh, what's the other question to? Uh, la otra pregunta fue que los reportes del agave montana que arribó a Oaxaca es más o menos que, que no estaba maduro, verde. Eh, ¿Cuál es el proceso en Tamaulipas para seleccionar el agave? Well, mature. Uh, agave for, for this mezcal, they use uh, agave maduro, mature agave, but uh, this agave from Montana, this came and take away only what they found. They find, uh, they, they don't know the producer, they go and sell to Oaxaca, to the other producer, for some producers to make business. It's, it's only the thing. So they cut, lo uh, cortan verde, no mature. It's good, no mature. But the traditional, they use um, agave maduro. Yeah. No sé I mean, si I, puedes reforzar. Yeah. Like yeah, ripe, I mean, agave. In, ripe agave. Yeah. In general, I know that um, people have been using um, more green agave because of the, the shortage that had happened um, in, in some of the production. And um, that, you know, was happening in several different locations, not just in Oaxaca. So, um, but um, I'm going to say, uh, should, I, should I open it up to more questions, more general questions yes. um, to the people? Yes. Yeah? Sure. Yes. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 So please, anyone who, who's got questions, I mean, I'm, the, the landscape of Tamaulipas and Nueva Leon are fascinating to me and kind of that proximity, not proximity, but bordering, but bordering Texas and just that, that back and forth history that, as I was saying before, the, the border was fluid. It was fluid for a very long time. Um, and, and having it close up so much, I'm sure has impacted uh, a lot of the economy in the area, um, and I'm just I'm, I'm curious as to to what it means for the alcohol industry um, with with there being a tightening of the border. Can, Anybody? Can, can you repeat that again, please? No, it, it was just a question, you know, it was more a question of, you know, there was, the, the border used to be much more fluid and open. And yeah. so there was a lot more commerce yes. that went across. And this yeah. was how destilados were shared. And, you know, so obviously in the last 15 yes. years, we've seen the real tightening of the border. So um, is that, is that having an impact? Um, on, on how destilados move, um, what is, you know, how, do you know what I, yeah, uh, 
I, you know, where the, the market for it, um, I'm sure there had been a, a market in the United States of people moving back and forth. Um, but. Ok, ok, let me translate to Luis. Eh, ella está preguntando, Luis, de que si ha habido algún impacto en los últimos 15 años este, en, en, el, en el intercambio de destilados de entre México y, 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 la, y la frontera con ahora que ha habido más este, las, con estas nuevas pólizas ¿no? de, de Estados Unidos, de las nuevas reglas, regulaciones de que están cerrando más las fronteras. ¿Tú crees que no. hay, ha habido un cambio ahí? No, it, it wasn't any, any change. Well, the, uh, the hardest time was when, when was a lot of, of movements was at prohibition. That's all. So, mm -hmm. doesn't right now doesn't move uh, any alcohol to the border or, or, or whatever. They stop the production for the, I'll say, if, for the. Para tratar de cruzarlo de manera ilegal, se, se, ha, se ha parado esto. Solamente sucedió este, en la época de la prohibición. No ha cambiado el, este, este movimiento. Sigue olvidado, se está olvidando. It's getting forget, forgotten the mezcal from the north of the country. as the same as, as, okay. as Sonora, Chihuahua, and Coahuila, with the Sotol. was the same history for all these states. So right now, it's you know, that movement that we, we probably think that they are. No sé si quedó claro. Got it. Uh -huh. No, got it. That, you know, because of the prohibition in general, that there hadn't been much movement across the, the border. Exactly. Uh, and, yep. So, and how many traditional producers are there in Tamaulipas now? There is, uh, in this area, are like, uh, eight or ten producers. There's no many. At, mm -hmm. at the other part, Tula, I, I think it's only one or two. And the same at Nuevo Leon, in, in, there is like eight or ten producers in, in Laguna de Sanchez in Santiago. It's very, very, muy contados, very, very few. A few producers. It's not, there are not so many producers. And down. so, what are the what are the challenges in preserving the mascales tradicionales in in Nuevo León and um, and in Tamaulipas? Is there um, in, so the two questions? What are the challenges to preserve um, mascales tradicionales? Uh -huh. And is there enough agave in the Sierra of Nuevo León to produce more mezcal if young generations want to pick up the craft? If more producers decide, or if more people say, I am going to produce mezcal tradicional. Okay. Uh, ¿cuáles, son los, ¿Cuáles son los desafíos eh, que tiene Tamaulipas y, y Nuevo León uh, well, well, para seguir así? Two different reality. I think uh, Tamaulipas is, is taking the good way. You know, uh, um, Tamaulipas is blinded, blindado. Blinded, uh, blind. uh, blind, uh, With this uh, crime organization that it doesn't push too much to the producers, only good things. But Nuevo León, we have a problem. Um, there is uh, only one producer. So, there is a lot of people is coming down and trying to take away the mezcal. So the people from the village is, is getting higher the price or doesn't having much mezcal. So one of the goals is to incentivate to the other producers to continue to, with the good production to, to make clean mezcal. It's one of my goals mm -hmm. to do with, with, the, with this uh, village, how, how this, how this needs to happen, probably some aliados, uh, aliados or brands or partners que, que puedan entender, people who can understand uh, this situation, not only go and buy mezcal and taking away the mezcal from this village. You have to you leave, you, tienes que dejar algo a cambio, you have to do something, knowledge, probably you have to 
look for a good market for these producers to can uh, to incentivate these producers to, to begin to, to make a, a better pr production of mezcal. There is enough agave in the region. Obviously, if you push much, you you probably is going to to finish with the agave. But we have an, an a good uh, begin to change things it in Nuevo, in, in Nuevo Leon with uh, programs of reforestation and, 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 and other programs to keep continuing with the, with the tradition. I don't know if, if I get clear. Well, yeah, no. I, I, that, was, yeah. that was clear. Max, Max was the one who asked the question. So let me know if it's, if it's not clear. Yeah, just um, to mention something, you know, like, sorry for interrupting you guys. It's like, it, it's, think about it, Susan, it's like, Again, you know, like when you're working with mezcal tradicional, it's, it's not a matter, you know, to come and buy and left. That's, you are not helping at all, you know, the producers, you know, like if you really want to get into it, please, you know, like you need to build, you need to do a relationship with the mezcalero because the mezcalero will become part of your family, you know, it's your family. So, but that's the thing, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of people now, like with all this boom of mezcal, so they just come buy and move on you know and when they don't have they come and buy again and they believe like that in that way they are helping them but actually not you know like if you really want to do that you need to go all the way you know like it is a relationship you know like i mean nobody uh, uh, owns the mezcaleros nobody is like the mezcaleros are there but as uh, luis mentioned before you know like right now like the in the specific with nuevo leon you know it's just one maestro mezcalero so it's like it, it, it will be cool, you know, like to have like a plan, you know, like to, to rescue that tradition, you know, and maybe uh, working together, you know, like with other maestros mezcaleros to, to like they can start to make a um, uh, clean agave again, you know, clean mezcal from agave without sugar. So that will be a good plan. You know. when, when we get a stronger the community, the village, when the producer gets stronger, probably we're going to be ready to a new uh, DO. Right now, it's, it's, it's very fragile to, to people can hear and, and try to make business with, with, the, with the producer. With the producer, You have to know very well how is the ecosystem that the people, the ecosystem of the people uh, natural and the relationship, the social things that happens there in the villages. It's very important for the people. It's, it's not as uh, Hugo says, go and leave money. No, 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 it's not leaving money. You have to leave something else than money. You have to get included with, with, with the people there. You know, like to have a little bit of ethics and morals and values, I believe is important, you know, like, I'm not saying like, you are not allowed, you know, you are welcome. But you know you need to do the things right. So otherwise, don't do anything. Mm -hmm. I Great. I don't know if you have All any right. more questions. Yeah, a couple questions, a couple of other questions um, just came in. Um, how how do people? This is from Jonathan Melman. Um, how do the people who live in the areas feel about the mescaleros? Um, are they revered? Is there a lot of um, respect and interest in maintaining the traditions? Is it seen as something important in the area? And in the By the people there. Okay. La gente, yeah. Okay. Okay. La, eh, la pregunta es que si la gente, eh, eh, la, pipa, la, la gente que vive alrededor de, de estas regiones, de qué siente acerca de los mezcaleros y si ellos los reverencian o si los toleran y si es un eh, sienten que las tradiciones son importantes para preservar no people doesn't care we we are as I told you we live in the border all the reference came from the north from the United States uh, as I told you about the beer so, so people we we need to make um, Orgulloso, ¿cómo se hace la, 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 we need la, to make the proud again, you know, like the yes, tradition, probably. like the mezcal tradition, the pulque. Mm -hmm. We need to bring it back. That's the problem with uh, uh, with Nuevo León. So, like, because through the beer industry, you know, and other 
uh, spirits, alcohol spirits, you know, it's like, it, it's almost lost, you know, like the, the, the heritage. And the, it, it's kind of sad in a way, you know, like uh, what is happening with Nuevo León. So it's like, it needs to be like a the reivindication, you know, of, uh, like to feel proud, yes. you know, that for that heritage, you know, like we need to start to doing things different you know it's not the same time oaxaca uh, even the people from here from monterrey this doesn't know that a uh, mezcal are in nuevo leon the most of the people of here uh, always the people from monterrey always always are thinking that the mezcal are from oaxaca and they don't know that the mezcal are from nuevo leon too so that's part of the problem interesting yeah um uh Steve's, uh, and I'm going to butcher your last name, Steve. I think it's Swinney, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, apologies. Uh, wants to know if the uh, mescal from Tamaulipas uh, that you have is a certified mescal. The mescal Please. from Tamaulipas is from where? Is it five? Certificado. Certificado. De CRM. CRM? Es está no? certificado con, en, con el CRM. No, no, the, we, we are uh, spirit no. distilling from agave. We, we are working with spirit distilling from agave. Es que es destilado de agave. Sí. So, yeah. Agave mm -hmm. distillate. Yes. Okay. No certified. Interesting. Um, all right. Do we have any other questions from, from folks about this? I mean, I, I will say, you know, and I think this is the frustration that a lot of us feel with the don, don, denominación de origen, um, is that we know that there is a history and culture of destilados de agave in pretty much every state in Mexico. There are agave, there's agave in every state. Um, whether or not the traditions have survived over time is a question, but um, how, how do you have any thoughts on how um, it should be handled as additional states will be applying for uh, denomination? Um, uh, well, it... I have a I have a, an answer uh, about something. Uh, tell me if I'm telling you something different, but you know, like I have a thing with the DO, you know, like. Tequila Dio, Mezcal Dio, you know, like, I guess the models, you know, like since the beginning, it, they were built, you know, like with this neoliberalism um, idea in a way, you know, like the, the mindset is the business mindset, you know, like to make money for medium of big companies, you know, no actually to protect, you know, like it is a lot of, uh, the destilado exists in the entire country. That's a fact, but it's a lot of maestros, mezcaleros, you know, mezcales tradicionales, like they, they, they don't even have a voice because for so many different reasons, you know, and even like um, they don't help them, you know, like to try to certify, you know, their, their mezcales in a way, you know, like that's the thing. It's, it's kind of complicated. It is nothing to blame, you know. It is Mexico. Mexico is complicated, you know, like as you know. So it's, it's just my two, my two cents, you know, about that. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, Luis, in, in working with, you know, these different producers in Tamaulipas, um, do, they, do they have children that are interested in carrying on yes, the tradition? For, or? For, yes, for example, well, not much. Uh, so, some assembly, sadly, that happens at the border, in the most of Mexico, but at the border, when you have um, a village, the press, or uh, a depressed person, is go away from the uh, from, from the village and go and look for a, a future, mostly at the United States. They are very close to the United States, but there is some. Uh, in Tamaulipas, for example, Jose Castellanos is the producer. The sons of Jose Castellanos, he helps. So we have to show the way that is a uh, very legal and per, very, como se puede decir, as, uh, digno, es una manera digna de ganarse la vida. I it's like a dignify, you know, like, you know, like to, to mm -hmm. make, uh, it's to feel, he needs to make, to feel proud again, you know, like to make in mezcal, you know, because 
there, there is future, there is future, but we need, as we told you about the Mezcal and Tamaulipas, make proud and, and incentivate the producers. I, I saw the other producer doesn't have songs. The songs lives in the United States or, or in Monterrey or in our big cities. The people, the family go away, the young people go away. It's, and it's, the, it's one of the problems here of, the, of these mezcals. Uh, Jorge Torres, the producer from from Nuevo León, his son, they're a pretty active uh, family. They own, they don't, uh, they do a lot of things uh, in the in the country, not only in mezcal. So they have a very level uh, of, of life, organic ambiente is is a very hard worker. So they don't have much trouble, economical troubles. But for example, Tamaulipas, I see that is very depressed place where the people are, are living, but it's one of, of the goals too, to show the way to this person to, we can make from his own work to, to get a, a, a better future. I don't know if I get understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it feels like the struggle that was happening in Oaxaca, you know, 15 years ago, um, that, there, there was not seen a, an economic future in mezcal production and so many people had left and, and now you're seeing younger generation, the younger generation embracing it more. The producer from Tamaulipas probably is, is, is more similar with the, the producer from Oaxaca. Anyway, one producer from Matatlán is not the same as one producer from, from, from La Mixteca, we know that, but probably here, these people from Tamaulipas are very, very similar to the producer of, of Oaxaca. And as you told you, it's like 15 years ago. But right now, I, I, I can see many of families in Oaxaca, they see the light and they are very proud of, of, the, of the, their own production. And probably it's going to happen in Tamaulipas in that way. Mm -hmm. so it's a bright future somehow, yeah. Interesting. All right, do we have any other questions for, for Luis and Hugo before we let them go for the evening? Um, wait, one more. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> thoughts on uh, El Tinieblo Mezcal, uh, which is, you know, a loaded. So this is, this is what I always say. I am, um, I, uh, I never encourage um, the the dissing of of brands unless there's a a specific issue. Um, but uh, El Tinieblo is the the mezcal that I've known for a long time as being from from Tamaulipas, um, and it had not been available in the U.S. for a long time, um, and that's now it is more readily available. Oh, man. You, ¿Quieres contestar esa pregunta? ¿Qué no, piensas no. del tinieblo? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a big brand with uh, the, the owners. They don't have uh, economical problems. These are no producers. They pay to some people to make the work, the hard work. That's all that's happened as a tequila brands, a most of the tequila brands. There it doesn't exist. Uh, Maestro Mezcalero in that brand because I, I didn't see it uh, in, in the in the labels of, of, of his of, of his mezcals. So it's it's not much Trump. No, hay mucha transparencia. There it is, is no not much, transparent. You know, it's like no much. I don't know much. I, I don't want to say anything bad or anything good, but I, I don't know. It's a big it's a big brand. I, I know that, and I know I know the, the owners. There is a, a family with a lot of money. That's all that I can that, that I can say. At this are uh, one of the companies or the brands that I bring in these uh, espadines, as I told you before, and making a, a, a different things. But I I never been there with in the factory of of Tinieblo, and that's all that I can say about this brand. I, I don't know much yeah. about it. And I know that, that many of us here um, have been following uh, the fact that they've done um, kind of an open, a crowdsourcing campaign to raise money 
Um, and uh, it's, it's been an interesting model to look at to see, like rather than going for um, the usual types of investment dollars, that they've kind of opened it up to crowdsourcing and a GoFundMe campaign um, to bring in investment dollars that way. So yeah, um, I, I always like to keep my eye open on different types of business models that are happening um, and to see what is, what is the reality. Yeah, I saw that also no long time ago. So that's my honest answer. Like, um, they, they, they don't need money, but okay, that's it. You know, like no more, nothing more to say about it. What was it? What was it? The question. Sorry. Lanzaron una plataforma hace poco, un modelo diferente para pedir dinero para poder meter el producto en los Estados Unidos, dándote como acciones de la empresa, algo así, para juntar dinero para poder introducir a los Estados Unidos su producto. I think it's, it's uh, a smart campaign of, of Mercadology. It's not, no it's as money for asking money. It's, it's to make know the, the, the brand. I, I think it's, it's very smart uh, campaign. That's all because as Hugo said, it's people that doesn't need money really, really. Uh, but it's some way to make noise to people look at this brand to see what they are doing. I yeah, think it's, people, it's yeah. the way it's, it's mercadology mm -hmm. is, is, is my point of view. This brand, I, I can say that is one of these brands is like this brands, uh, Mezcales de, de Hacienda, you know, the, I don't know if it's a translation, Susana, Mezcales de Hacienda, Mezcal de Hacienda. There is any translation? Uh, you know what uh, I mean? Is, do you know what a, is Hacienda? Yeah. Hacienda? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like the, the hacienda form of of production style. Exactly. Um, there is yeah. one. There is one model of production of this this kind of mezcal. It's, it's the same of the tequila. It's the same with the tinieblo. It's, it's my point of view. It's, it's the same model as as mezcales de mezcales de hacienda, donde estas haciendas uh, mezcales okay. es el mismo sistema. Okay. So it's um, for for people in the audience the. The hacienda style of production, um, if you've seen it in tequila, it is a, a large, it, it's hard to translate like exactly what a hacienda is. The first time I had seen um, that style of production was I, when I was in San Luis uh, Potosí last year. Um, I had never seen like the hacienda system, um, which is basically, it's kind of its, its own village um, and capable of, of doing a lot of different things um, production wise and haciendas focused on uh, different haciendas had a different focus in terms of what they were producing um, so that is that is what I know all right are there any any other questions here from folks um, so uh, we are very much looking forward to seeing a Mata in the, the market here in the US uh, outside of Southern California. So it's at Madre Mescaleria um, and then also apparently Flask, um, a store in Highland Park in Los in Angeles Los as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the um, North, in Northern and, California, you can find it in uh, KNL Wines, Health Spirits. KNL Wine. Uh, okay. ledgers and, and in different bars, you know, like, I don't want to mention of them because if I forget one of them, you know, they will kill me. But like, <laughs> so it's, it's better to play safe. But uh, in looking forward, like, um, uh, with coming new plans, you know, I want like people remember like um, Amor Mata is a special edition uh, from Nación de las Verdes Matas. And we are looking like to expand a little bit, you know, like maybe Texas, we are looking for Texas and other states soon, you know, like, if you know someone, please let me know, um, you know, like, any and, questions and you're you have. You're just in California now, not just in, in New York, correct? Just in California right okay. now, but, like, we are open, and, and more than that, you know, it's like, um, uh, thank you, Susan, for having us and for... Uh, having open you. uh, your space, you know, like to promote a little bit what is a mezcal tradicional. 
I guess it's important, you know, like we can learn together. Well, it's, you know, it's so great to hear, to get a, the perspective of the history in place um, as these new destilados uh, come into the market to, to really understand the differentiation from the destilados coming from other, other places in Mexico and the fact that each is so unique to the place from, from where it's from. Um, so I thank you and Luis, I, I thank you very much for all of the information and may, maybe we all be together at a Mexico in a bottle sometime. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, it is big. Uh, uh, um, and so, no, please, well, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the uh, invite us to explain what about these mezcals from, from the north. We, we have the other region, the two regions in, in, in Durango. It's probably in, in another time we can explain it. But something that probably it needs, we need to explain our model of, of working with, with Hugo, with Ryan. We are like a family. It's not only business. We think in the same way. Uh, something that is, uh, Ryan is, is my importer in the United States and Hugo is, is part of, of him and Rocio, we are a team and we are a family. It's the way that we work as with the producer is very close. We, work, we, are only, we don't do only transactions. We do relationships as the same yeah. as the producer. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Susan, for, for inviting us. Well, thank you. And um, I will have a recording of uh, the talk to send out to everybody by the end of the week. And next week, we are very much looking forward to having a conversation on Monday um, with Tequila Patron and um, Amores, Mascal Amores Amaras, um, about some of their sustainability projects. Um, so looking forward to that conversation. And I hope you guys have a good evening. Thank and you so thank you all for, for joining us. No, thank you so right. much uh, for your time and hope to see you soon, Susan. Yes. Sorry for my language. Okay. See you soon. <laughs> it's fantastic. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye.